1 Corinthians class. We're going to finish up 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and get into chapter 3 tonight. So what we're saying here is that the church ought to be unified in Jesus Christ. And chapter 2 emphasizes the nature of our message because our message is, and we said three things here, is Christ-centered. Paul says, I mean, I wanted to know nothing among you but Christ and him crucified. And because that gospel message was eternally planned, and now because that gospel message is supernaturally revealed. In other words, how do you believe the gospel? Why do you believe the gospel? Because God has revealed the gospel to you. I remember when I was working as a brand new Christian, I was working at a, a warehouse in Sea Caucus, and I was just like, I would just sweep the floors and clean. I, I, I pushed this like, uh, it was it was almost like a sanitation truck that would clean, you know, how, how those sanitation trucks clean the sidewalks. It was kind of like that, but it was a mini, and it would just clean the floors. And I would put, and, but there were other people working, and, and uh, they, they worked the, the forklifts, you know, unloading and loading the empty bottles in this warehouse and so forth. But I would meet the truckers sometimes. And, you know, there was so much cursing and so much, like, hate toward God, often, especially my boss. He hated Jesus. He cursed the name of Jesus every single sentence. And then I would try to tell him about Jesus. He said, shut up about that Jesus. I said, but Al, you talk more about him than I do, you know? <laughs> I mean, he did. He cursed him. But I remember meeting a believer. And man, it was like, I didn't know what church he went to. I just, I just knew that he believed in Jesus. And I believed in Jesus, you know. And we had good fellowship there. It was encur it's, it's really encouraging when you're out there, you know, and you're all on your own to meet another believer in Jesus who believes the gospel. The gospel is supernaturally revealed. Now, we talked about this, we emphasized this beginning last week, chapter 2, where Paul says this. As it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither hath it entered into the heart of man, the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Now look what Mr. Wiersbe says on page 39 about this verse. This wisdom applies to the believer's life today. This verse is often used at funerals and applied to heaven. But the basic application is to the Christian's life today. The next verse makes it clear that God is revealing these things to us here and now. Now, one of the things God reveals to us is heaven. So you can say, well, God has revealed heaven to us now. So in that sense, yes, that's one of the things. But it's much more than just heaven. And we don't, in other words, here's the thing. We don't wait until we're in heaven to experience verse 9. Now, this is what John MacArthur says. And where did it go? I had it here. He says, the free quotation of this verse and you go to Isaiah 64, you can go there, is from Isaiah 64, 4. It is also frequently misapplied. Paul is not referring to the wonders of heaven, but to the wisdom God has prepared for believers. When can you have that wisdom? Right now. So that's, see, this is how this verse is often applied, that it's talking about some future time, the wonders of heaven. But Paul's saying, we have the wisdom of God now to apprehend and understand the things of God. Written where? In the Bible. The word of God. So he says, uh, Paul's not referring to the wonders of heaven, but to the wisdom God has prepared, prepared for believers. His point is that, listen, his point is that the natural eyes, ears, and hearts of men cannot know or comprehend his wisdom. It is prepared only for those that love him. So I, that's, that's what I do strongly believe Paul is saying about this passage. Now, look in Isaiah 64. And to me, it's so interesting, too, how he quotes this verse. But he puts a different nuance on it, actually, from what Isaiah does. In Isaiah 64, he's asking God to come down. Rend the heavens. 
bring revival. Really, this is a prayer for revival. 64 verse 1, that the mountains might flow down at your presence. And then he says in verse 3, when you did terrible things, which we look not for, you came down, the mountains flowed down at thy presence. What do you think he's referring to there in Isaiah? He's referring to Mount Sinai, when God gave the law, and the mountains shook and quaked and trembled. And he's saying, for thou, you did terrible things, which we look not for. We didn't ask you to do that. God did it. You came down, and now verse 4, for since the beginning of the world, men have not heard, nor perceived by the ear, neither has the eye seen, O God, decide thee, what he has prepared for him that, what's the last expression? Waited. What does Paul say? Paul doesn't say wait. He says what? To them that love. Isn't that interesting? So, but what is Isaiah saying here? Isaiah is not pointing. It's clearly not heaven. He's not talking about heaven at all. He's talking about what God has done in the past. And basically, if I could just phrase it this way, what Isaiah is saying is, no one has ever seen with their eyes the things our God has done by any other God. No other God has revealed himself the way our God has revealed himself. He's talking about how, for since the men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, no eye has seen, no ear has heard what you have shown, what you have done. So he's actually saying that the Jewish people saw God do something that no one has ever seen any other God do. I think that's what he's saying. So now Paul takes that verse, and now he says, with the coming of Christ and by the Holy Spirit, I believe he's putting a different twist on it. And he's saying that no human eye, just through physical resources, through our, our physical senses, whether our eye or our ear can understand the things that God has prepared for them that love him. But God has revealed them unto us by his spirit. So he's saying that our, our natural senses cannot understand the wonders of God's word. Who has to teach them to us? The Holy Spirit. You know, um, Think about like the book of Ecclesiastes, even our city, our life, our world. What do people, where do they go to for satisfaction? Through physical senses. They try to satisfy themselves through their, through our senses, right? They try to touch. The Bible talks about the lust of the flesh. You know, if I touch, if I see, and look at the internet, look at how people gravitate just toward seeing, seeing, constantly seeing, or hearing. People just listening to everything today, listening to music, to this, to that, to everything. And they're, what are they doing? What are they looking for? Yeah, yeah, they're looking for that. But the book of Ecclesiastes says the eye is never filled. No matter how much you see, no matter how much you, the ear, your, the touch, that's right, you just want more and more. And that's always the allure, by the way, of fornication, adultery. It satisfies, in a temporary way, all of those sensory experiences, senses, and does give a level of pleasure temporarily when done outside of God's will brings immense pain and suffering. But that's the allure of sin. It's always the Lord sin. But what, I, I don't know, I saw something in the news today about Hollywood and what's going on with a very prominent person in the Hollywood world and him being exposed for all of his abuses and, and just how so many even look to Hollywood, you know, for all of this satisfaction. But we have, we have what will truly satisfy us in a book of, with on white pages and black letters, you know? 
Think of that. But the Holy Spirit teaches us. And when the Holy Spirit teaches us this book, we're satisfied. I do believe that. So I think that's what Paul is saying here. Okay, so let me give you these blanks. I think I've said a lot of what I really want to say, but you just go through with this. He says he's not speaking about, do you have the last blank on page 15? This verse is not, okay. A, the Holy Spirit reveals now the things God has prepared for them that love him. And I, I really think what he's again saying is that true satisfaction is not experienced through the physical senses, but through the Lord. God wants to be our satisfaction. Number one, the verse is a quotation from Isaiah 64, 4. Number two, this is not speaking on the glory of heaven, but to the wisdom God has prepared now for believers. And you might want to put somewhere through his word. I believe the Bible is at the heart of these things of God. Where he says, the things that God has prepared for them that love him, that's the word of God. God has revealed them unto us, the word of God, by his spirit. The spirit searches all things, the word of God, the nature of God. Yea, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him. Yea, even so the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. So letter B, the Holy Spirit searches the deep things of God. That's verse 10. The Holy Spirit searches the deep things of God. Verse 11, the Holy Spirit knows the things of God. Which things that, of, that God knows, who knows what's really going on inside you? Your spirit. And who knows what's really going on inside the heart of God? The spirit of God. Where's the Holy Spirit? He's, he's in you. Think of that. Who knows what's going on inside you? Your spirit. Who knows what's going on inside of God? The Holy Spirit. Where's the Holy Spirit? He's in you. Okay, so verse 12, that's what he says. Now we have received. Not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God. That we might know the things which are freely given to us of God. See, so that goes right up to verse 9, right? See, he's saying, your eye isn't going to perceive the things of God. The Holy Spirit will teach you. It's not your eyes. It's not just your... So we read the Bible with our natural eyes. But it's the Holy Spirit which will teach us the Bible. You're using your natural ears right now. But if you're understanding the Word of God, it's not me even. It's not what you're hearing. It's the Spirit of God teaching you the things of God. Okay, so the Holy Spirit, number letter D, indwells us. And letter E, the Holy Spirit leads us to speak, verse 13, which things also which we speak, not the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Now, again, remember the whole context of what he's saying here. He's saying that the gospel to the unsaved world is what? Is it wisdom to them? It's foolishness. Is it power to them? Oh, it's weakness. But he, and then Paul's saying, glory in the gospel. Don't glory in men. And that's really his main emphasis here, too, in this whole passage. They were, they were focusing on, on Paul and Peter, and they were glorying in men. Paul's saying, they couldn't have taught you anything if it wasn't the Holy Spirit who taught you. Glory in the Lord. Now, comparing spiritual things with spiritual, what is that? What are the things he's talking about here? saying what have we said that these things that God has prepared for us that he reveals to us that he teaches us what are the things the things found where in the Bible so when he says comparing spiritual things with spiritual what is he saying what do you think okay comparing one scripture with another scripture do you think that do you think so I believe so, absolutely. And that is clearly 
a law of Bible interpretation is to compare scripture with scripture. Now it's important that we, we compare the right scripture with the right scripture, not do a Harold Camping who would compare scripture with scripture and then put all, all of his allegorical twists on it, you know? But yes, I do believe that comparing spiritual things with spiritual does relate to that Bible interpretation principle of comparing scripture with scripture. So the Holy Spirit leads us to speak, verse 13, and then verse 14 through 16, the Holy Spirit matures us. Now, verse 14, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Who's the natural man in this passage? The unsaved. The unsaved. We're going to talk about that as well. Neither can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. They're foolishness to him. Remember, now again, that's foolishness to him. What's the things? The things of the gospel. Things found and written in the word of God, of the gospel. Foolishness to him, they're spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual discerns, judge, it says, it doesn't say he judges everything like you, where we sit as a judge over everything. The word judge there is meaning he's able to discern all things. What are the things though, specifically? The things found where? He's talking about the things in the word, in the context. He's not saying that we're judge and jury over everything that ever happens and I'm infallible but it's saying that we have the ability to go to the Bible because we have the Holy Spirit in us and interpret the Bible, comparing scripture with scripture and studying the scripture, being led and directed by the Holy Spirit. It doesn't mean we're gonna be perfect, but it does mean that you are a New Testament priest and you can go to God and it's not the church's job as one big church says, you can't understand the Bible, you have to let us interpret it for you. That's not taught in this, is it? He, he is judged of no man. God is going to be our judge at the end of the day. Who has known the mind of the Lord? That he may instruct him. But we have the mind of Christ. Why do we have the mind of Christ? Because we have who? Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit. Yeah, isn't that something? So, the Holy Spirit matures us. Last point on this chapter is spiritual Christians have the mind of Christ. That is, he or she thinks, he, he or she sees the world from God's point of view, values what he values, thinks as he thinks, and not as the world thinks. Okay? Any questions about chapter 2? Okay, then let's get into chapter 3. And we're not going to read this whole chapter to start, but we'll read verse by verse as we go. Now, again, let's just back up. Paul's main point in chapters 1 through 4 is unity in the church. In chapter 1, the unity of the church is, is based upon our calling. That was chapter 1. And he emphasized how we're called to the gospel. And then division is inconsistent, not only in light of the nature of our calling, but in the nature of our message. That was chapter two, the message. Chapter three is our church. And that's back on pages nine and 10. And so you already have that. But So page 14 at the top, he focuses here on the nature of our of of the church. I'm sorry, page 17. Focus on the nature of the church. Because of the nature of the church, what the church is, and who's the head of it, not two Jesuses, the church should be unified. Now, sadly, we don't see that. Paul is emphasizing that in this chapter. Now, he gets into some really big things, but he's always going to come back to his main point, which is there's disunity and there should be unity. Because look, for example, in chapter 3. Look what he says in verse 4. You see, his, he gets back to that point. While one says, I am of Paul, another of Apollos, are you not carnal? And he says it again at the end of this chapter. In verse 22, 
whether Paul or Paulus or Cephas or the world. So you see, he's, he still has one main thing in mind, but, but he's hitting at different things, but then he's tying it all together. So I believe what ties this chapter together, and Wiersbe has this, and I agree with him, is that we need to be wise about the local church, and even bigger, really, the, the church, all who are in Christ. So, bullet point under letter C, the context of the whole book of 1 Corinthians is the church, and this chapter especially is the church and the local church of Corinth. The church is seen as a family in this chapter, a cultivated farm or a field. The church is a farm. It's seen as a temple. The church is seen as being tested by fire. Really, you could, you could say the local church because he is dealing specifically with a local church problem in Corinth. So like a great doctor, Paul understands the spiritual sickness of the Corinthian church trying to provide a remedy. Now, there's at least three reasons for their sickness. They were immature, they couldn't eat well, and they couldn't get along. So, you know, when you don't eat well, you get sick. Yeah. Now, let's read some of these verses here. I'll read from verse 1 through 4. It says, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal. Even as unto babes in Christ, I have fed you with milk and not with meat. Hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able, for ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, another I am of Paulus, are ye not carnal? Who then is Paul, who is Apollos, but ministers by whom you believe, even as the Lord gave to every man? Now, isn't this interesting? He just says, you have the mind of Christ. He says, you judge all things, you judge them no man. And yet now he calls them what? Carnal. I thought he just called them spiritual. Can a carnal man be spiritual in this context? Think about that. Okay, well, so there's three, there's a number of things here that give a proper perspective of the local church. The first perspective is towards spiritual maturity. In other words, Every member of the local church should seek to be spiritual and mature. How do we do that? Well, one of the ways is that we don't, we're not driven by personalities. That's really what's, I thought, root of the Corinthians carnality. Okay, so let me, let me just look at this. Let's look at this now. In this passage, and even going up to chapter 2, there's three kinds of people that he mentions. We already ran into this in chapter 2, verse 14. What does that say? What kind of man is spoken of there in chapter 2, verse 14? What kind of man? The natural man. So that's letter A. The natural man, he's the one who lives in the material world without being touched by the Spirit of God. This word is used in Jude 19, sensual, having not the Spirit. The natural man of chapter 2, verse 14 is not saved. The gospel... <laughs> Is foolishness man, right? So the natural man, he's not saved. He may be hostile or he just might be careless or indifferent to the things of God. Then in chapter 215, what kind of man is talked of there? A spiritual man. So who's a spiritual man in this passage? Someone who has the who has the Holy Spirit? Just certain believers? Later on, he's going to tell the Corinthians, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? They weren't living in that way, but their body was. A spiritual man. This individual has the Holy Spirit. He's a saved person. The Holy Spirit is in him. He's able to discern the things of God in the Word of God. But now in chapter 3, we run into another kind of, of an expression Paul uses. What? He says, I speak unto you as unto a carnal, or a, yeah, babe, a carnal man. We're going to stick with that term, a carnal man. That's letter C, the carnal man. So who is this carnal man? Okay, page 18. Is the carnal man saved? Yes. Yeah, because who? Who is the carnal person? It's the believers in the church. So we'll have to say, yeah, these carnal men... They're saved. 
So if they're saved, are they spiritual in the sense of what he has just said? Yeah. Does he say they're not spiritual? Because they are behaving like he did with them. Yeah, he says, he doesn't say they're not spiritual. He says, I can't treat you as if you were really spiritual, even though you are. But you're not acting that way. Okay, so. Excuse me? This is yeah, yes, it is different. Yeah, in Romans like 8. Somewhat similar. Yeah. Similar to Romans 8. So the way I put it here is the carnal man is saved, I believe, in this passage. but in the, And in, so in that sense, he's a spiritual person in that he's saved as the Holy Spirit. But he's behaving in an immature way and in a sense. And in particular areas, he's like a natural man. So he's a spiritual man in reality, but he's, he's not acting, he's acting more like the natural man. So you see where Paul is really kind of rebuking the Corinthians. He says, you believe in the gospel, but you're acting, you've been, you've been influenced by the foolishness of the world, which they think is wisdom. And the Christian always has the tendency to be influenced by the world. So what does he call them at the end there? They were like what? Babes or babies, in a spiritual sense. He says, I couldn't feed you with, with meat, but with milk. You couldn't eat the filet. Lobster tails. Oh, they had to have milk. That's no fun. I'm sorry. Yes. Uh huh. They were being led by the flesh and not by the spirit. Right. They're contrary the one to the other. So he says, I he could not speak to them as spiritual, though they were. Although they had the spirit, they were manifesting certain kinds of sinful behavior more aligned with the thinking and acting like an unbeliever. So a man with the spirit may behave in a carnal way. That's in your notes right here on point four. A man with the spirit, and there's a blank there, I got. On page 18, you have the notes? Yes, yes. So a man with the spirit may behave in a what? Carnal way. Now also... They were behaving in a carnal way in one area. At least here, there's other areas that Paul will get into. But somebody could behave in a carnal way in this area and maybe behave in a spiritual way in another way. You know what I'm saying? Because here they were being driven by personality. And I think, I think we do have a tendency toward carnality. Maybe I should point to myself. You know, we do get loyal to people sometimes. We do get loyal to particular denominations. You could even say loyalty to not, you could make application, I think, to loyalty denominationalism here. And you might ask somebody, are you a Christian? Well, I'm a, and they say their denomination as if that's, I didn't ask if you were a Baptist or a Catholic or a Pentecostal. I said, are you a, a, a born again child of God? You know, um, or we can get driven a lot of, a lot of, Christianity today is personality driven. There's a lot of like people that are so popular on the internet, you know, that kind of thing. That's karma. If you're driven by those personalities and you say, well, so-and-so said that, and you, you have a tendency more to quote that person than, than the Bible, I think that's a problem. So a man with the spirit may behave in a carnal way. The carn so how is the carnality manifest? And you could fill in these blanks from verse 3. What are the three terms used there? What says, for ye are yet carnal. There was what? Envying, strife, and divisions. That's A, B, and C. Envying, you know that word is sometimes used in a good sense of having zeal, if you were to do a word study there, but it's also used of bitter envying of worldly wisdom in James. And here, that's how it's being used here. Strife, contentions, he used that word back in chapter 1 in verse 11 of Corinthians. So it's these 
Strife and divisions. It's right there in the text of chapter three of chapter three, verse three, and divisions. And divisions is a, a work of the flesh, Galatians 5:20, a serious, dangerous behavior in the church that should be pointed out that creates, you know, false teaching was created in division in the church. So so the first thing is we have to get ourselves in a place where we're trusting the spirit and not being driven by man. Not being reliant upon men. There's no pastor that's infallible. So don't think that if a pastor makes a mistake, oh, you know. So some people, if the pastor makes a mistake, they, they're like, out of there. Well, you know, I mean, if there's real doctrinal problems, you might have to think about it. But men are infallible. Um, maybe they just put, they were putting these different men up on pedestals. Don't put anyone on a pedestal. Glory in the Lord. Again, glory in the Lord. So that's the first thing, a proper perspective toward our own spiritual maturity. And I think the thing, that a takeaway on this is we can be spiritual in one area and carnal in another. So a carnal Christian isn't like you're just carnal across the board. You could be carnal across the board. But in here, their carnality is really in an area we might say, that's not that bad. They were just like favoring in certain ways, but yet that was creating real division in the church. Because I, I guess they were rejecting to, to, in ways they shouldn't have some of the other servants God had given to the church. So it was carnal. Number two is a proper perspective towards God's work in the church. So here Paul compares the church to a field or a garden. So again, the context here is the local church of Corinth. And God gives the increase in the local church. So let's read these verses. And why don't you guys read uh, these? Edgar, if we could start with you. And if you could read from verse, uh, we will read from verse 5 through 9. Okay? And uh, we'll each read a verse across, across the way and over to Audrey. Who then is Paul and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believe, even as the Lord gave to every man? I have planted Apollos for, but God gave so then neither see that fact of anything, neither be that walking, but God that giveth the increase. Now okay. he that planted and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. We are God's husband, we are God's good. Okay. So we need to have the right perspective towards God's work. In the church again they were glorying in men and that was what the the issue Paul has if you if that's what he concludes in verse 21 right of chapter 3 he says therefore let no man glory in men glory in the Lord they were glorying in men but what does he remind them who are these men they are only what in the church verse number five they're ministers and the word there is diakonos, which means they were table waiters. Now, yeah, A, ministers. Now, do you know a famous restaurant? A famous restaurant. Is that restaurant famous because the table waiters? <laughs> does, it, does the waiter make, oh, the waiter left the, the restaurant. Nobody's going to go there anymore. What makes the restaurant famous? The chef. That's right. Not the table waiter. So that Paul says, I'm like the table waiter, you know. You gotta look to the to the Lord. He's like, you know, the owner of this operation. We're ministers. And then he says, God uses one man to do what? Plant the church. God uses another man to what? Water. One man plants. So who is the planter of this church? Verse 6. Paul, he says, I planted. Who watered it? Who came in? Yeah. 
that. You understand that analogy. You plant the seed, and you got to water. Now, and but God gives the increase. And that's not talking about, in this, it's, it's talking about souls within the church. And planting a church, it's talking about I planted. So it's, it is, I think, biblical to refer to someone as a church planter. Because Paul says, I have planted. He planted the church. He was the human instrument. So men, not verse 7, I get from that verse, have to remain what? Humble. Look what he says. Neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God. It sounds like God's the only anybody. That's what I put there. God is the only anybody. And not, that I, not that we minimize the church planter, but it's God. Because if he doesn't bring the increase, what's planted? Or what, what's watered? What, what's there? What's increased? Nothing. And the next page. Only God brings what? The increase. You know what we really need to pray for, too, is for God to do Yesterday, after the service, there was somebody who came in. I didn't even see him. He said, way in the back, he came up to me. And he's from India. He's from a Hindu. He says, I want to convert to become a Christian. And it was like, so I sat right there with him and went through the gospel with him. And he, he was like just fruit falling off the tree, you know? That doesn't happen every week. I wish it happened five times every week. <laughs> Well, that's what we need to pray. Lord, make this happen more. You know? Yeah, bring the increase. You see, God, only God could do that. You know, and I didn't know who he was. I didn't know where he came from. I'm like, how did you even find us? But. I remember one that tonight, the little guy, he was in the country sons. One of them prayed and asked God to. Send people to Amen. Well, you know, that's true. That little boy, every Wednesday, he he comes with a specific prayer request. Yes. Actually, he thinks about it all week. You know? <laughs> so it's a very special little yes. request that you all yes. get. So it's worth coming to prayer meeting just to hear yes. his request. <laughs> but only God saves souls for sure. Yes. And I put in the footnote there, John 4. 34 through 38, that's where uh, Jesus talks about how one man sows and another man reaps. And sometimes, see like yesterday, even this man from India, he didn't get saved because, oh, the message just was so, no, it wasn't, that he came in wanting to be saved. So there was already sowing in his heart. So we reaped yesterday where others had actually sowed. So it's not like, I, oh, Oh, aren't I? That was such a, aren't I great? Yeah. No, it wasn't. It was the Lord who did it, you know? We were just there. We were there. That's all. We were there. And just try not to mess up what God's doing. That's my prayer to the Lord. But, so God brings that increase. And so that's why we don't grow weary either in sowing the seed. Because we sow the seed. We might not reap. But we have to keep sowing and somebody else might reap later just like we will sometimes reap the benefit of other people's sowing. so don't ever think this isn't doing anything we don't know what it is doing it is doing something you you we have to believe every time you give out the word of god it will do something it will do something remember the seed on the the ground the wayside the different soils something happened every single time Sometimes the devil just came and plucked it up, but something happened. You know, it got the devil going. The devil was afraid something was happening. Remember the seed on the wayside soil? The devil was like, I got to get to work here, you know? So something is happening every time we give out the word of God. Okay. Men labor in the same body. That's verse 8. He that planteth, he that watereth are one. Okay, so who's the one who planted? Paul, who's the one who watered? And they're what? One. Where? In Christ. In this, they're working on this. They're not working in a different field. Do they have a different purpose or the same purpose? The same purpose. To see the church thrive, the kingdom of God increase, the church of Jesus Christ to be blessed. Okay, so men labor in the same body. They're one in the same body. And verse 9, it says... 
We, we are laborers together with God. Who's laborers together? Who's the we there? Again, Paul and Apollos and Cephas, as what you can maybe include. So that is men labor with who? The same Lord. Paul wasn't serving with. And in other words, when Paul was planting the seed, who was with him? Jesus was with him. The Spirit was with him. And when Apollos came in and he was watering the seed, who was with him? The Lord. You teach a Sunday school class, who's with you? The Lord. You sing that song, who's with you? The Lord. And God's with us. He's with his people. His Holy Spirit is dwelling in us. So he says, we are laborers. I like that. Not just for God. With God. He's with us while we're laboring. He doesn't say, okay, just go out there and do that. No, he goes. He says, I am with you. Always. Always. He's with us. every. So that's actually really important to know, like when you do anything, <laughs> that he's with you. Because we're doing it for him. You might be alone doing it. But you're doing it with him. We're laborers together with God. You are God's husbandry. And... That's the word for field. You're his garden. You're his. Those are the words that I put in your notes there, right under point two. Paul compares the church to a field or a garden. You are God's farm. This is really stupid, but I'll say it like at the beginning, Paul was saying, you're like babes, you know, in a fan. We're like a family. So we're like in a fan, but now we're in a farm. That's what I said was really stupid, but. The fam to the farm. Okay. We're, but we are a family. But we're a farmily. I mean a farm. Too. <laughs> oh, sorry. Enough of that. Okay. We are like God's farm. He's the Lord of the harvest. But now he's going to switch analogy. You are God's husbandry. You are God's... Now he's going to go from a farm to a temple, to a building. So here we need a proper perspective towards judgment for the church. And now he's going to get into this huge concept of the day of judgment for a believer. So we need to have, first of all, verses 10 of it, the right what? What do you think is blank there? We, need, we must have the right foundation and who is that foundation only one here jesus christ for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid which is jesus christ verse 12 we must have the right what does he then say paul says i've i've laid the foundation which is christ him crucified that's why paul says i i, I purpose not to know anything among you but jesus christ and him crucified because why he was building the foundation says, now let everyone take heed how he builds there on. Who is building on his foundation? Who came and watered what he planted? Again, who's he talking about? Talking about Apollos. For other foundation can no man lay with what is laid, which is Jesus Christ. If any other man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. So we must have the right foundation, but now we must use the right materials. That's letter B, letter B. And what's the difference between these materials? Some boing and some don't. Some are very combustible and some are not. Yeah. Okay, so look in your speaking actually. And on page 54, page 54. And that's what you fill in right there. So the precious stones there, what are the precious stones? Gold, silver, Precious stones. Wiersbe says they are what? On page 54, they are permanent. So write that down. Beautiful, write that down. Valuable. Hard to obtain. In other words, you have to dig for them. Some materials will burn very easily. Some will endure the fire that's coming, some will not, right? What, what are the three that will burn easily? Wood, hay, and stubble. Wiersbe says these are 
So right all those down, passing. What, what else? Temporary. temporary. Well, passing, yeah. temporary. Ordinary. Ordinary, ugly, cheap, easy to obtain, easily burned. Hard to burn, easy to burn. So the gold, silver, and precious stones are permanent, beautiful, valuable, hard to obtain. The wood, hay, stubble are passing, temporary, ordinary, even ugly, cheap, easy to obtain. Now look what Wearsby says these things are on page 54. And we'll say this, we're going to... Just say this, and then we'll, we'll, I think it's about time to close in one minute. Look what Wiersbe says on page 54. He says what? I personally believe, right under there, on page 54, Paul's referring to what? The doctrines of the Word of God. Do you, do you think? In other words, are these materials the doctrines of of the Word of God. Okay? This is what I like to comment here. I actually like to wrestle. I like to wrestle with the text. I, I like to read somebody and see what they say. I like Wiersbe. But does it mean I agree with him all the time? No, especially here. So, you know what? John MacArthur, he says, the materials are the believer's works. The believers well, well, are they is it the doctrine of the Bible or is it the, that's quite different to say right so I think I put this in your notes John MacArthur says they represent and then he, he talks about our works specifically and then our motives our conduct and our service now but what okay now go to the Bible what does it say if any man built upon this foundation gold silver precious stone wood hay stubble Every, what's the next two words? Man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare, because it shall be revealed by fire. The fire shall try every, what's the next two words? Man's work. Of what sort it is. Verse 14, if any, what? Man's work abide, wherein he hath built, he shall receive a reward. If any, what does it say? Man's work. So how many times did he say man's work? And what's going through the fire? The wood, hay, the stubble, or the gold, silver, and precious stones. So the gold, silver, precious stones, the wood, hay, stubble, is based on this passage, what? Man's works. Okay, and we're going to stop right there. And we did, we're, we're right at the top of page 20. The phrase man's work is used in verses 13, 14, and 15. It's clear by this that the materials stand for our work that will be tested by God. Okay, so do we have a quiz next week? Again? Uh, <laughs> yeah, what you like for tree? another quiz. What you like for tree? Okay, so. For what now? Three is doctrines. Refer to the doctrines. Okay, now, here's the verse I would like for you to know. 1 Corinthians 2.2. 2. It's a short one. 1 Corinthians 2.2. 2. So that's I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's a nice, easy one. And then no... Um, the things we've talked about, the spiritual man, the natural man, the carnal man, um, the main points of, of what we're talking about, the nature of our calling, the nature of our message, the nature of the church, is the reasons for unity. And just up to that point about the wood, hay, and precious stones, that these stand for our works, you know, things like that. So just look over your notes. Okay? There you go.